My core text today um, is, as far as I can tell, well, I'll put it this way. My family says I'm better. <laughs> so, I don't know what that tells you about before, but uh, I, I, I do feel like I'm, I'm uh, that everything has come back. I mean, if I've got any kind of side effect, it's that I, I wake up a lot earlier. I mean, for a long time, I would get up at two or three in the morning, and I was just so elated to be alive. And of course, then I was writing a lot, and then I was reading and writing a lot. Um, and I still tend, tend to get up kind of early. Uh, but other than that, I feel like everything came back. Uh, my doctors would tell you that they do, they do not have a good explanation for it. And I do not have a good explanation. I mean, when I re read my red medical records, it's, uh, it's really just uh, absolutely frightening. I mean, my brain stem was, was really taking a, a big hit. It wasn't just my cortex, but I was really going down hard. And I don't have a good explanation uh, for why, you know, why, why, why it all worked out the way it did. I, I can tell you the effect it's had is it's kept me very focused because I, I've been a lot less likely to just say, well, anything can happen, you know, forget about it, uh, but to get to the bottom of it. And that's why it, uh, it kind of drove me to really um, try to come up with some answers about why is this? How come consciousness can exist much more richly outside of the physical brain? Because I know it can. And then the question is, how does that happen? And of course, that takes you into quantum mechanics and non-locality, and you start realizing that, that time is an illusion and that future, or I should say future and past, are very much an illusion, but I think there is a now. Um, but that now is very kind of mysterious, and uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to answer it all. But once I started to get a glimpse of what this was telling me, and, and there's something else called the hard problem of consciousness, which I'll go into in my book. The book I'm writing is for the general audience, and it's, I'm going to try very, very hard to wake people up about this. Uh, but I can tell you the hard problem of consciousness, which was defined by David Chalmers in 1996, his book, The Conscious Mind, and, but it had been worked on as an idea you know, for decades before that. It's very simple. It's just this kind of feeling of awareness that we have sitting here in this room. There's absolutely nothing at all that any neuroscientist can tell you. They cannot write the first sentence in the book that explains how that phenomenon comes out of the physics, chemistry, uh, biology, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology. It do doesn't exist. The first sentence doesn't exist. And it's much easier for me to see it from the other way around. Um, you know, that, that consciousness is the primary thing, spirit. And again, like I said, it, it, it sounds like I'm uh, making a joke uh, about, you know, we are conscious in spite of our brain, but that is actually true. Our brain works over time at kind of dumbing it all down. And of course, when I say that, I'm kind of acknowledging that the brain exists, but in reality, it's as much of a figment of, of kind of the, the, the illusion uh, as anything else in the physical universe. So, um, Joe. Well, that, that, is, uh, that is a very good question. I, I mean, I think, you know, most important and first item on the list are, are, are kind of quite different. I, I think in the, in the grander scheme of things, what, what I would really like to do over the next few years is um, uh, make it very clear to people that this is all very real, that this, uh, you know, there's that book that the DOPS group put out, Irreducible Mind, which I think is a very good book on, on kind of the science of showing the reality of all these uh, various phenomena uh, that they do exist. There's no question that they can be quite vexing to prove. Um, I think part of the problem there is, again, because of, of, uh, of consciousness. I think the fact that the hard problem and just the phenomenon of consciousness itself is the fact that it's the only thing that I can think of in modern human knowledge that is that we can say is probably insoluble. 
that the human brain and mind will probably never fully understand the mechanism of consciousness. Now we might design you know, quantum computers or biologically enhanced brains that'll get out there and might figure out how our consciousness works. They'd never be able to explain it to us. Um, and I think, I think that um, kind of getting more to understanding this phenomenon of consciousness um, for all that it's really worth, given that it's uh, probably the one thing that uh, is inexplicable that we know of, and there's some logical reasons why that's the case, but really kind of coming to grips with that. And it, it really comes to, to a point of acknowledging uh, uh, kind of that deep mystery of our, our spiritual existence, which is eternal and outside of space and time, uh, but making that more of a uh, kind of a mainstream understanding, because we've spent the last century, if not four centuries, thanks a lot, um, kind of wandering down the wrong pathway and, and thinking that you know, because the light's really bright over in that little corner, that if we understand everything under that bright light, then that's, that's good enough. And yet, there's a tremendous amount out in the darkness, you know, outside of the reductive materialist world that is not understood. And I think probably the biggest part of what, what, what I would like to do, and hopefully we will all end up accomplishing, is broadening the boundaries of science to where, you know, today a lot of people are using the woo-woo word, you know. This is woo-woo. Well, guess It all really is, but it's real. And it is, it's where when, when, you know, when this body dies, I know I'll be freeing and reuniting with my, my kind of higher soul and going, what a, what a trip that was. But knowing once again uh, what we, we all know when we're freed like that. Uh, much more about the nature of that fundamental reality. And, and I think to kind of get uh, the mindset out there we, where people just know, yes, of course this is, this is real. And let's try and understand it better. Just because it's tough to understand. And I mean, there, it turns out that the, it was designed by minds far beyond ours. So, you know, I, I kind of, when, when People talk about a physicist and a theory of everything. I, I have, have uh, kind of this idea I put out there about the, the kind of alpha chimp, you know, in a band of chimps on the Congo River. And he's the one who's smart enough to realize there's another side to that river and there's another jungle over there. Um, you know, and he knows a lot more than, the, than his fellow chimps. But he doesn't realize that all the 747s are flying over and all the satellites and the Hubble's up there and it's looking out, you know, and and the, and the gap between us and the real wisdom in that realm is so great that it's uh, the highest form of hubris to think, you know, that our little reductive materialist scientific minds, which are really kind of in kindergarten, can explain the deep vexing problem. So I think if we can, if I would feel happy just helping to move the boundaries of science out a lot to incorporate that all this is very real and then start getting it. How do we really get a handle on that? How do we really explore that we know that our consciousness can go out into time and space uh, far beyond the boundaries of what we, we consider to be boundaries? Yes. Can I just say one thing? Yes. Uh, the one thing that I would say is that I, I think the important thing is to create the experience for the scientists that they then cannot prove to themselves. You, you exemplify where I would like to see most neurologists today. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the job of the institute. Right. Create the atmosphere and the place for the experience that, that they can't deny the existence of consciousness beyond what they study. Right. Yeah, well, that, I, I'm, I'm glad that the DOPS crew, you know, are signing up. They're going to be doing hemi-sync. They want to do courses here. They want to really kind of work to kind of get to the bottom of this. But I could tell when I went there a few weeks ago, uh, they, they were still at this mo in this mode of saying, well, you know, when you all have really good people over there, 
And of course, Joe, they were talking about one adventure they had with you that completely blew them away. You know, all their detectors were off scale. And, and so they were saying, well, you know, anybody else like that, send them over. And I said, no, 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 you're not hearing this. You have to go there yourself, you know, and that's it. This is beyond linguistic anything. You don't, you know, watch DVDs or take a weekend course and then get all this. I mean, uh, they have to go there. And of course, that kind of breaks the rules for some scientists because they want to be in the white coat writing in the notebook about the subject, you know, observer observed. Sorry? Well, it started back in the early 1930s when <laughs> <laughs> really did. Um, parts of this I've only kind of learned more recently, but uh, um, I don't know if I should tell you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, kind of the way I discovered it or how it happened chronologically, it's kind of probably the way I discovered it. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I first read about this in Michael Talbot's book, which was written in 91, and I found that book to be just fascinating, the Holographic Universe, and I was so amazed. I said, well, where's everything else this guy has written? And of course, I Googled him, and he died in 1992. So that kind of left, left me hanging, and, uh, but it's, it's a wonderful book, and and I read that, and then just as often happens, three times in one week, I heard about the Monroe Institute, first in that book, and then through somebody else. And, and then uh, as I was uh, uh, emailing Bruce Grayson about going up to present my NDE to the DOPS community. Um, so, and, and I was, I remember being kind of amazed that the Monroe Institute was 45 miles north of where I live. And it was 45 miles north of where I had moved in 2006. You know, we'd spent 20 years in Boston, and then for reasons that were somewhat obscure, we moved to uh, Lynchburg. Kind of wonder, why was it we moved from Boston to Lynchburg? And of course, after my coma, when I found the Monroe Institute, it became very obvious why we'd moved to Virginia. Uh, it made a lot of sense. Um, and then as I started uh, coming up here, because Carol and Karen Malik came to the talk I gave at DOPS, uh, which I'd set up with Bruce Grayson. Um, and I realized as it was coming close to the time of the talk that it was uh, to the hour, my second anniversary from waking up from coma. Wow. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, gave the talk there and, and they invited me to come visit. And so I did come here to visit and uh, they popped me in the, you know, the lab up at the top of the hill in the cabin, and I had kind of an extraordinary experience where I saw somebody I didn't know at the time uh, as they closed the door and I was kind of in there floating around. I thought they projected it into me. But anyway, so I knew this place was kind of magical, and then, of course, went through gateways and all that. And as, as part of my story, um, the, uh, I'd had several mysteries in my NDE. As much as I thought it was a really profound, deep NDE, it was really amazing, and yet my father was not there. He had passed over four years earlier. And for me, that was really vexing. Why in the world wasn't he there? If I had scripted this, he would have been there, and he wasn't, there was not a sign of him. And I had this beautiful girl on the butterfly wing, and I didn't know who that was. And, um, you know, I, I actually went back in there. As I said, I would, I would be in this beautiful valley on the butterfly wing and then outside of the universe with the orb of light and this divine creative power. And there were times where I would become the entire higher dimensional multiverse, kind of flipping back and forth in these lessons. And then I would be back down to earthworm eye view. And part of it was a lesson in how linear earth time is not. Uh, that was part of it. But there was a repetition, it was back and forth, and there were three separate times that I went back in by remembering the spinning melody of light and, and this beautiful music, and that would open up and take me up into the valley on the butterfly wing. And um, that was all very uh, instructive later on in trying to figure the whole thing out and, and what was going on. But as I read more and more, more about NDEs, I was left with those very vexing 
questions. You know, why wasn't my father there? And who in the world was that on the butterfly wing? I remembered her perfectly. I knew exactly what she looked like. Beautiful blue eyes, brown hair, shoulder length, dressed in a kind of a peasant outfit, but it, it was kind of powder blue and, and uh, kind of a, a peach color. And I could remember her perfectly and her smile. She never said anything. And her thoughts would come straight into my mind. You know, very reassuring. You were loved, you were cherished. You have nothing to fear. And it was just this incredible warmth. And I could remember her face so clearly that when I woke up out of my coma and was recovering, I knew I had never met her in my life. And that was a big game stopper. So I was really, you know, kind of wondering how in the world can this all be? And uh, I actually got the answer to that, or the beginnings of the answer, about uh, four months after my coma, uh, because I was reading one of Elizabeth Kubler Ross's uh, books, and there was a story in there about a 13 year old girl who had had an operation, and uh, she did not wake up after the operation. She was in a coma. She had a very profound near death experience, and she was very comforted by her brother, who was there to welcome her and, and kind of teach her all these things and then help her make a decision about whether or not to go back, and she ended up coming back. And when she was talking all over with her father, she was very mystified. She said, I don't have a brother. And he said, well, you did, but he died three months before you were born. And it turns out that right around that time, my, I had found out back in 2000 that my birth mother, I was adopted, and I found out my birth mother uh, had actually gotten married to my birth father. And that was a big shock because that was not in the cards from everything I knew from 1954. And I found out in 2000 that they got married, they had three kids, a daughter had died, and that it was not a good time to come back in their lives. And I found all that out in about two minutes. And that had the effect of kind of deleting my belief in you know, a God or prayer or anything. I mean, it was gone, and that was in 2000. And then I, found, I reunited with them in, in 2007. So all, you know, that was all very beautiful, but a bittersweet because of the sister who, was, who had died in 1998. And so I read the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross story four months after my coma, and it was right around that time that my uh, birth sister had sent me a picture of Betsy, who had passed over in 1998. And it was looking at that picture on my dress, I went, oh, my God, because that's who was with me on the butterfly wing. And she was looking at me out of the picture like, you finally get it. <laughs> and and it, it, was, it was absolutely stunning, completely blew me away, and yet there was no mistake about it. And then I started kind of quizzing my birth family about, you know, Betsy and her personality and trying to, and, and then it became very clear that, that that was who it was. And it turns out the other part of the puzzle was answered on the last day of my gateway here, February of 2000, uh, 2011. Um, and because I remember kind of asking on the way in, I just wanted some uh, clue about the path I was on. Implication being that it's the right path, the wrong path, irrelevant or something, but I just wanted some clue. And floating off of the white marble bridge at Focus 21 into the mist and I kind of came down into this cafe, dug into the side of the gorge, and my father was sitting there with his college roommate. They roomed together in the early 1930s. And uh, my father turned and gave me one, one look and, and the little wink he used to give, and everything came right into me, and I knew exactly, yes, I was on the right path, and that, yes, he was there for my NDE, but he couldn't be apparent to me. Um, and he was very insistent on that, and, uh, and then I came to really kind of understand it and, and realize that if he had been there, I would have been much more likely to discount the whole thing as what happened when your brain is dying, and you know, that his memory bubbled up and that was that, but he couldn't be there. But he told me, you know, as I floated off into Focus 21, that of course he was there, but he couldn't be apparent to me. 
um, and that, in fact, my birth sister had to be the one on the butterfly wing, so I would get it uh, and get the big message. But I was still left with that, you know, as often happens, you know, find an answer and then there's another clue deeper down the rabbit hole because I didn't know why his roommate was there. And um, his roommate was a guy named Agnew Bonson. And they remained good friends uh, in later years. Uh, both lived in Winston-Salem. It turns out, I found out months after all this, that Agnew was very good friends with Bob Monroe. They were both pilots. They both were interested in consciousness. They were interested in anti-gravity. You know, all these kind of things, and, and in fact, Agnew had, had uh, passed over in a plane crash in 1962, and I, I knew that very well because my parents were very good friends with, with Agnew and Katie Bonson uh, in Winston-Salem. Um, but I, I didn't know more about that plane accident, and, and I actually got that email from Agnew's oldest daughter. March a year ago, I was on a job hunting uh, trip in Ohio and had just driven by the Worcester, Ohio airport around midnight, got into my hotel 12 miles down the road and opened her email. She's living in California now. And it was a very long detailed email. I'd already gotten emails from, from Scooter and, and from a bunch of other, you know, kids of, uh, of Bob Monroe and Agnew trying to put it all together. And um, so as I was sitting down to read her email, she was talking about how Agnew, her father, had passed over in a plane crash in Worcester, Ohio in, <laughs> you know, in 1962. And I was like, I'd never been within 400 miles of that area. And the fact that a few minutes earlier I'd driven by the airport, I thought, okay, fine. <laughs> I believe it. I got it. And uh, in fact, I heard that, uh, that uh, Agnew's kids used to come visit Bob Monroe, and that he had had several interchanges with Agnew Bonson after that plane crash, you know, in the, in the, in the spirit realm, and that uh, Agnew's kids all to this day found that to be just wonderfully reassuring, you know, because they would come and talk to Bob Monroe, and he would give them that direct linkage with their dad, but that was kind of part of the answer to me deep in my, uh, you know, floating off of Focus 21 to try and put some of the pieces together about the path. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think a lot of the, the issue here is trying to really understand, um, you know, we think we understand the physical realm in some sense and, uh, and yet uh, when you get deep down into uh, uh, kind of some of the quantum experiments today, uh, like one I was reading about a few weeks ago that uh, I've sent to a few people in this room, email just had to do with, um, it was a simple experiment with DNA, uh, you know, very uh, purified sequences of DNA in a tube of water <coughs> passing 10 hertz electromagnetic signals through that and having another tube that contained pure water and no DNA, and after an hour or two starting to see DNA of that exact same sequence appearing in the second tube. And, and I, think, uh, I think we're still really kind of in our infancy at trying to figure out uh, you know, what some of the messages are about uh, the nature of, of, of kind of physical reality and, and uh, that that quantum world of, uh, you know, molecules, DNA, things like that, and how the information is, is, is transferred. And I think that only gets much more complex when we're talking about, you know, what's going on between minds and being in synchrony and exactly what, uh, what that means. I mean, there's no question that uh, something very profound can happen between minds. I mean, even before my home and everything, my, my wife had two older sisters who were twins, and they would all the time have these episodes of twin telepathy, you know, finish each other's sentences, <coughs> dream each other's dreams, they'd be halfway across the country and having kind of shared experiences and calling each other up, and I kind of assumed there's something there, there's some linkage, uh, and yet I didn't know exactly what that linkage uh, was. So 
So I, I think um, you know, I, I think there's certainly a lot of work to be done to try and better understand a lot of this uh, and, and what it really means. Yes? You talked about the fact that when your brain essentially went offline, of course, that's a part of that portable function isn't there to deter that. Well, I'm I, interested in your thoughts. Well, I, I've given uh, kind of a version of, of my talk and my story to a lot of physicians and nurses and all that and to me it's it's very clear and this is what I tell them is to always assume that the patient is there and that things are getting in uh, and I, I mean even people who are brain dead uh, because uh, I think it's very clear that that's the case and and so I mean, there, there are cases that come up in the newspaper now and then about people who, uh, you know, are comatose and have an EEG that looks amazingly like an awake patient. Well, it goes way beyond that. You know, I don't care if the EEG is flat. Um, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is acknowledging that the brain is not the cause of consciousness. So it's, uh, I think it, it's very clear that uh, I think as a healthcare professional, and the message I want to get out to uh, everybody in healthcare um, and to family members um, has everything to do with, uh, you know, prayer gets in, what what people say and think gets in. I mean, you can just kind of assume that that consciousness, the freer it is of the physical limitations, the more it's actually tuned in. So. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not this dumbing down. I mean, it's, uh, that's kind of the old model. That's what I would have told you before, is it gets dumber and dumber, and then it just is as dumb as a stone. Uh, but in fact, it actually, you're getting rid of the, the blinders and allowing it to, to run free. But of course, uh, then you start getting, you can get into all kinds of discussions about self, boundaries of individuality, because I firmly believe that at the deepest level that there is one consciousness and that's it. It's all consciousness of all eternity throughout the multiverse and that there are emergent kind of septations that appear and, and we have this illusory uh, view of our individuality. Um, if you've read that wonderful book by Joe Balty Taylor, My Stroke of Insight, where she's talking about the arterial venous malformation in Wernicke's area, you know, in this speech receptive part of her brain that ruptured and as it bled and kind of took out her uh, language defining center and she started to blend with become one with the chair and the rug and the desk she was becoming one with everything and this incredible sense of love all around her as the you know the definitions and the boundaries were destroyed by the hemorrhage she was freed up to realize the oneness that she shared with kind of her material realm. I think the physics crowd will get on board before the psychiatrist, yeah. but, uh, but that's a good thing, you know, because we want to know the physics, because the physics is, is the reality. You know, and that's, I mean, that, that's, uh, I can tell you, I mean, I learned a lot about NDEs, but I've also had to do one boatload of reading about, you know, physics, cosmology, quantum gravity, uh, and then Claude stuff. <laughs> trying to get, you know, to get on the right page with this. I thought Penrose was interesting and smart, and then I found, you know, Claude's uh, books I, I think are just incredible. So, but I think that's a huge part of, of where we all want to go. We want to know the truth. We want to get out there, and, and it really means broaden those boundaries so that we <laughs> encompass all of this and, and try and really get at truth. But the truth is going to be, for one thing, it's, one, it's something we'll never ever truly get as human beings, but that's fine. The journey is plenty of fun. Uh, but uh, it, it, uh, I think it'll be just a wonderful uh, thing for humanity to get back to re-acknowledging kind of the power of that divine spark of our spiritual existence and realizing that you know, the body and the physical reality uh, is not all there is to the world. I mean, that's kind of a meaningless uh, existence.